Lord's Supper, actually. I want to invite you all to turn in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we are, we are going through, and I'm going to switch over, Chris, to my headset, if it works today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. And chapter 4 is a, a little shift in the book of Thessalonians. The first few chapters, Paul spends a good amount of time uh, focusing on uh, greeting and explanation as to uh, who he is and what, what he's doing and why he's doing it, pointing to the gospel and his ministry in difficult times, in trial. And uh, really focuses on what we need to hear, that God has redeemed us, but we still struggle until that time when we will be with him forever. And the people of this small, young church in Thessalonica are going through trials, and Paul's going through trials. And so they are both understanding and experiencing difficulty at the same time in different places, and he wants them to know that he understands that. And then in chapter 4, he shifts from that, that sharing in trial and focusing on God's presence with him into what is it like to live while under trial because there's a temptation uh, to, to, uh, to either run away or to hunker down and endure when we're suffering. Fight or flight. So what does it look like when a Christian is going through struggle? And he addresses two very hot topics at that time that are same hot topics today. Two prominent issues. One, Aaron talked about last week, and that's what do we do with our bodies sexually that is different from how the world treats and understands their bodies sexually. And the next topic, which is today, is how do we understand what is our perspective, what should it be, of death. So listen to this. This is verses 13 to 8 through 18 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of, a trump, of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I do pray that you would use these words to shape our hearts, to inform our minds, to direct our paths, Lord, in a way that is pleasing to you, even when it may look different to the world or feel awkward to us, Lord, that we would be faithful. And we need your spirit to do that. So would you give us your spirit? Give us ears to hear. In your name we pray. Amen. For a Christian, for someone who is a follower of Jesus, the way that we live life should be different. When the world watches, whether it's at work or at home, on a sports team or in school in a class, the world is paying attention, watching, the way that we do stuff should be distinct, the way that we engage with friendships, 
the way that we do our jobs, the way that we navigate sex, as Aaron talked about last week, the way that we parent, the way that we are husbands, the way that we are wives, and the way that we do everything, it should be distinct. We should be informed, and that's what Paul says, that he wants us to be informed about how we grieve, the way that we grieve, the way that we weep, the way that we experience sorrow should look different. And how we view death our perspective on what happens when this life is over, whether we are confronted with our own death or whether we are experiencing the loss of someone we love. Our view of that shapes how we grieve. And there's a lot of different ways that people view death. I, I, this has been on my heart because we've had uh, several deaths recently in our extended family, and also because just thinking about this sermon. There are different ways people view death. One is to fight it at all costs, at, with all that we have at any expense, do whatever it takes to hold on to life. Live in a way that prevents dying. Another perspective is to ignore it, to distract ourselves, to keep ourselves so preoccupied with the, the present and the moment that we're not even thinking, and I think this is a lot of us, we don't even consider what we all know to be true about every one of us in this room. That we will die. Another variation of ignore is the perspective of, hey, you only live once, right? Just enjoy the moment. Don't think about death. Just push it off. Enjoy the moment that you have with the people that you have and the things that you do. Because this is the one moment you have alive, and then next, you're food for worms. Another perspective is to consider it and fear it. To live in constant fear. And this may be someone who has experienced the death of a loved one or several loved ones and so they're so con con consumed with the possibility of de their death or the death of someone they love that they do all that they can to protect against it to avoid risk to sequester themselves away or maybe even to protect against loving other people because they know there's the potential that they may lose them and then another one is death as an escape hatch. This life is hard. This life is so painful. So consumed with anxiety or fear that it's just not worth living in any longer. And we don't know what the next life is, but surely it's better than what we're experiencing now. To so take, take that chance to take their own lives. All of these options are tendencies that even Christians may fall into if we think about it. And all of these options have one thing in common, and that's when, when it comes to the perspective of death, it is ultimately hopeless. There's little to hope for, nothing to hope for. And that informs and shapes how we mourn. If we mourn, if we're grieving, which is proper, he's not saying here, don't mourn. He says, when you mourn, do it in a way that is different. Do it in a way that has injected into it hope. And not a vain hope, but a hope that is secure. So what I want us to do is to take some time to consider death together. To consider death, but to view it in a way that gives us not hopelessness, but that is filled with hope. So that when the world sees us grieving, they'll know that there's something different that is there that they will also be attracted to and long for. Paul is telling them that they can grieve, but their grief in view of death is filled with hope. Three ways that he addresses this that we will consider. One is that for a follower of Jesus, the view of death 
is transitional. The view of death is transitional. Second, for those who follow Jesus, their view of death, our view of death, is triumphant. And then third, for those who follow Jesus, our view of death is ultimately and eternally relational. It's transitional, triumphant, and relational. First, the view of death that we should have is transitional. Look what it says, first of all, just in the way that he uses the word. What's the word that Paul uses here for the word death? What does he say? Sleep, right. He uses the word sleep, and that's a common word that is used to describe those who die. They are asleep. And some have taken this, certain theologies have taken this and promoted an idea of soul sleep, that when you die, you go into a state of unconsciousness until the time that Jesus returns. But that's not what he means here. The reason he uses the word sleep is because he wants us to know and trust and believe that it is temporary. It's not a permanent state. It's a transitional state that we go into that, uh, that then leads into another state. It's a bridge from this life into another life. Look what he says to the followers in Thessalonians who are wrestling with the death of their loved ones. The life expectancy at the time of Jesus was in the 30s. People were dying young. It was common, children, to die regularly. And people were grieving these things. And they're asking the question, what happens? Now that we believe in Jesus and, and our worldview has changed, what are we to believe about our loved ones who have already gone? And he says this. Verse 16. <laughs> For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trumpet of God. We'll get to that in a little bit. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them. Death is seen as temporary. They will be raised. And not only that, they will be raised first. Our view, if we are in Jesus, if we trust in Jesus, if we believe in who he is, our perspective of death has to be shaped and molded. Our experience of grieving and grieve, we should and will. But speaking into that also is the promise that those who die, those who we know who have already died, those who we love and care for, will die, some of them before you, and we will grieve, and we will die. We will face death, but the reality is that that death is temporary. It is not permanent, and our hope can rest in that. On September 15th, 1963, Anybody know what happened on that date? Huh? September 15th, 1963. In Birmingham, at 16th Street Baptist Church, there was a bomb that exploded. Weren't supposed to be any, wasn't supposed to be anybody in the building. But four girls were in that building, and they died. Martin Luther King spoke at the funeral of these four girls, and he said this, death is not a period that ends the great sentence of life, but a comma that punctuates it to a more lofty significance. Death is not a blind alley that leads the human race into a state of nothingness, but it is an open door which leads man into eternal life. It is proper to grieve. And I know sometimes I've heard Christians say that a funeral should be more of a celebration, and I, I get where that comes from. But I think in those situations, it's dangerous to suggest that grieving is improper. But we should grieve because the person who has transitioned is no longer with us, and that's sorrowful. 
The relationship has changed. But for those who are in Jesus, we can grieve and at the same time feel the kernel of hope that we know that we will one day see that person and that the life we have here have now is short in comparison to all of eternity when we will be together with those who have gone before us. And so, yes, weep. Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus. Jesus wept at the prospect of his own death in the garden. Is it because he didn't know what was going to happen to Lazarus? Is it because he didn't know what was going to happen on the cross after he died? No, he knew. He knew more than anyone else. But he still wept. But he wept with a hopeful weeping, a hopeful grieving. Why? Because death is temporary. It's transitional. It's not a period. It's a comma. Second, we grieve with hope because we have a perspective of death that is triumphant. It is victorious. As I mentioned, there's been multiple deaths in our extended family. Alice's uncle, Nat, was diagnosed with cancer at Thanksgiving, and he passed away in the spring. Father, grandfather. Within weeks after that, her cousin Natalie took her own life, early 20s. And around the same time, another of her uncle was sitting in a room with his wife, reading a book. His wife looked over. He was gone, completely unexpected. Each of the funerals were very different. We didn't, weren't able to go to any of them, but there was lots of conversation. One was... All three involved grieving, but one had a joyfulness to it, a celebration of his life, and a hope and a reminder that we would see him again. Another one, small, very sad, very painful, and then the other based on the wishes of the one who passed away, said, I don't want a funeral at all. There was no funeral at all. People grieve differently. People see death differently. People experience it and contemplate it in different ways. And it's easy as we see those around us dying. It's easy for us to become fearful. It's easy for us to have a defeatist attitude which can lead us either to fight it or to live in constant fear of it or to just ignore it. Like I said before, it's easy to fall into those categories. And as we get older, we will have those same temptations. But what Scripture tells us and what Paul tells the book of people of Thessalonica here is that we can have a triumphant view of death, not a defeatist. Listen to what he says to the small church there. We do want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Where does he point? What's the basis of our hope? He points to the past. He points back. He points back at Jesus who entered into death. Jesus entered into the thing that we oftentimes fear the most, death. He died, and yet he conquered death. Jesus was victorious over death. Jesus defeated the thing that we fear for those around us and for ourselves. He brought death to an end. Death has lost its sing, sting. He points back and he reminds them of the one that they have now committed their lives to following. He 
has led them now in a new perspective of death, and that is that it is not our final enemy. And then he points ahead in verse 16, and you already heard it. He points to the past, and that's something that we can consider as we can contemplate death, whether it's others or our own, that we look back and we remind ourselves of the one who has defeated it. But then we need to also take time to consider the future. Consider what is ahead when Jesus returns. Listen to verse 16 again. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command. And that language there is a language uh, that describes one who is, has authority over. It's a word that is used oftentimes to describe a ship's commander when he's telling his people to row, 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 go. It's a voice that commands and demands authority. When Jesus returns, he will come in victory. Victory over what? Victory over sin. Victory over death. Death will be done. It will be no more. Why? Because he has authority over death. And then it goes on to say, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and he's borrowing Old Testament language and imagery to describe celebration and victory. When Jesus returns, he's going to return in the clouds. And, and some have supposed that that is literal, and it may be. Others have suggested it is metaphorical because it describes him coming from the place where God is. And, and God is in heaven, and that's up there. But in reality, we don't really know where heaven is. So whether he comes literally in the clouds, like I can see out there right now, the image of Jesus, I can see the clouds, and what if the image of Jesus coming down from them to take his people into eternal life? Whether it's literal or metaphoric, the idea is that he is going to come from heaven to us victoriously in celebration and authority. And he will take those who have died and those who are still alive who have put their trust in him and we will reign with him for all of eternity our view of death yes should cause some amount of grieving but it's a grieving that is laced with hope because we know death has been defeated we are triumphant over it because of what jesus has done in the past and what he will do in the future Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must be put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. And it's talking about our future glory. And he says this, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, and this is application, therefore, verse 58, my beloved brothers, therefore, Midtown Church, with this perspective of death, this triumphant perspective, for now, until that time, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. See, the world, the perspective of death in the world is that it is a period. It is the end. So live life to the fullest. It's hopeless. But for the Christian, we know that death has been defeated so we can live life yet to the fullest because we have the hope that one day we will be with him forever. Our hope 
is substantive, not wishful thinking. And it speaks into our grieving. Finally, we need to view death. We're invited to view death for those of us who are in Jesus relationally. It's tempting to read this passage and to kind of kind of get consumed into the, the nuts and bolts, the, the where, the when, the how, the order. Now who goes first? So the dead go first, and then we come next. So we're going to meet him in the clouds. Is that literal clouds? How's this all going to come down? And Paul doesn't give us a lot of detail about that. And if we get caught up in those details, and it's important and good and even fun to discuss these things for sure. But if we stay there, then we miss what is most important about the transition and the triumphantness of death. And that is that it is relational. We will see him face to face. The person that we have given ourselves to. That man who died on the cross and rose from the dead. We will see him clearly. And we will be with him at the very end. He gives us these encouraging words. We will always be with the Lord. Isn't that good? Isn't that good to hear as we wrestle in this life, whether we're wrestling with our own fallenness and our own sin, whether we are struggling to trust and understand how God has wired us, whether our, our bodies are falling apart, as I often feel at age 51, the finiteness of my mind and my body, as we are struggling in this life, and as we are facing the fact that we all, unless He comes sooner, we will all die, we need to hear that we will always be with the Lord. We will always be with Him. And that's a relational comment. Another transition that is exciting and scary is childbirth. Now, I, I've never given birth to a child, but my wife has given birth to four. And I was there in the room when it happened. A long time ago, men were told, go away and come, we'll invite you back when the baby's born. But now they know that it's good for the husband, the partner, to be there with them. And when we were going through that experience, uh, I we read or we were trained, I don't remember, to, to look in her eye, for her to look, and during the painful part, look, look at me in the eye, and even times to touch her so that she would be reminded that I'm there with her. I'm with you. It's a relational experience. It's more than just having, giving out this pound of flesh or eight pounds of flesh. It's a relational experience between a husband and wife, but even more that, it's a relational experience between mom and dad and baby, right? For dad especially, we see the stomach growing, and we know, we see it, some bumps and some movements in the skin, an elbow or a, a foot. We don't experience the same as a mother, but we can see this hypothetical, idea that there's a child there and then you go into the hospital or you give birth in your home and all of a sudden what was hypothetical now you see face to face it's a relational experience you know you're a father Jesse you're a father where's Jesse you're a father your shirt dad, dad right you're a dad dad now but that's going to take on a whole new reality when you see that baby face to face, right? Well, in the same way, we understand and know that we have a relationship with Jesus, but death is going to bring that to a whole new reality. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, so you'll know it's not just me being poetic. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is describing He's, he's coming out of the gifts of the Spirit, the discussion on the gifts of the Spirit. And he's talking about, this is how we live now, right? Using these gifts of the Spirit. But there's going to be a time when these gifts, some of them were no longer going to be valid. Why? Because the perfect will have come. Right? What's he talking about? When the perfect come, he's talking about when Jesus comes and, and sin is no more. When that time comes. 
Verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. He's talking about a transition in life. And he compares it to when the perfect comes. Verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. He's describing what's going to happen at that moment when the perfect comes. When death will be no more. And we will see Jesus face to face. Here's another way death is relational. It's not just a relationship with Jesus that will be all the more beautiful, but it's also the relationship that we have with each other. Verse 17, then we, right? Not then I, not then you. He says, then we, those who are dead and those who are alive, we will come together in the clouds. We will be together. Death is a relational experience because it's enhances and explodes and and it causes an even greater beauty into what we experience here on Sundays or on Wednesdays or Thursdays or any time when we gather together and we can enjoy being together even though sometimes we might drive each other crazy that there is going to be a time when we will be together and see Jesus face to face without sin it's, it's going to be, be the beauty of fellowship and love as one people with one faith and one God for all of eternity. Our view of death, yes, grieve, mourn, weep, absolutely. But our grieving needs to be shaped and formed, whether it's your child. And we've had some in the church who have lost children. Or whether it's a parent or whether it's a spouse, or whether it's a close friend, or whether it's just our fear of that. It is informed and shaped by the hope that death is transitional, that it's triumphant, and that it's relational. I was listening to a TED Talk that I found online on this very topic, and I, I, there were a lot of them, actually, and the one, this one, made me curious because the title it said it talked about death and it said hope as a problem to death and i was like okay i'm curious what is this about hope as a problem to death and i and i, and I heard it was and it was interesting it made a lot of good points this woman was talking about how the medical industry and even the families of those who have been uh diagnosed with a terminal illness the emphasis is on doing whatever it you can to infuse hope into their hearts so you, the doctor would say hey you know what there's, there's studies going on and who knows maybe between now and then they'll come up with a solution an answer a fix for your illness or hey let's keep fighting let's keep going through the uh you know the care or radiation to fight this Let's get into a fight mentality. Let's do all that we can to give hope because hope stirs the heart. And this woman was like, no, that's just false hope. And what it does, it stirs in the heart of the person this idea of fight, fight, fight. And the relatives, the wives, the children are all like, dad, mom, fight, fight, fight. Keep going. More appointments, more medicine, more, more doctors. And they're not able to just enjoy their final days. And I get where she's coming from. I understand that. But at the end, she said, that's not the hope that a person should have. A hope is in the days that they have to enjoy those around them. And I was thinking, that's good, better, maybe. But that's still not hope. That's not hope. That's just enjoying the moment. It's another take on the ignore it, distract you only live once, so enjoy the days you have. But it doesn't give any hope for what is next. 
and the beauty of following Jesus is that we have a real hope. We don't need to fear death. We can take risks. We can go on the mission field or send children on the mission field to dangerous places. Why? Because death is not our enemy. Death has been defeated. So when we gather together and we're facing our own fear of death or coming alongside those around us who are going through the death of a loved one, we can do what verse 11 says. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Encourage one another with these words. Just to end, a few practical points about coming alongside of those who are suffering because of death. One is to be present with them. Just be present. Being present in their lives. Not to lecture. Not to preach. Don't immediately send them a link to this sermon. Maybe later. Or if they ask for it. But listen and ask. How are they doing? How are you feeling? How can I be praying for you? Would you be willing to listen to some scripture? Can we sing a song? Be present in their lives. And as opportunities allow, remind them that there is hope. There is hope in the face of the thing that we fear most. There is hope because death is temporary. Jesus is triumphant. And on the other end of it, for those who know him, we will see our king face to face, and he will say, come, welcome, my good and faithful servant. That's the encouragement we need, and we need to give it to others. Let me pray. Father, would you help us um, to grieve well? This applies not only to the grieving that comes with death, but the grieving that comes with any loss at all any sorrow in this life is small. We feel it, and it's, it can feel overwhelming. But Lord, can you help us to put it in the perspective of all of eternity? To know that no matter what happens, come what may, you are with us. Help us to put our eyes on you. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to gather in a circle to receive the Lord's Supper.